Hi everybody. Thanks for warming the the chair, Teresa. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> now to something completely different, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, away from global considerations, away from considerations in large, large countries, uh, going down to Central Europe to a, a very small country, <coughs> which I'm rep representing, and talking about particular measures that we, that we try to implement and the success and the failure of these particular measurements that we're trying to implement in soil conservation. I've put agricultural soil conservation in the place because yesterday when we were having dinner, uh, Luca mentioned the, one of the largest problems being soil sealing, uh, which I'm not going to talk about, although it is in fact a large problem, particularly in Austria, where only about 30% of the country can be uh, populated. So the rest cannot be used in any, uh, in any sense. Yeah? So we have a, really have a large problem of, of soil sealing and land, land, uh, land taking, let's say. However, not going to talk about this. It's not my specialization. I am working in the Federal Agency for Water Management, which is part of the Ministry for agriculture, and it's important to know that agriculture is the first word in the name of this ministry. Agriculture, uh, regions and tourism, as it's called now, it has changed its wording. Well, it's, it's been changing its wording all two, three years. Uh, so we are part of the, of the section which is dealing with water management. And uh, the work that I'm reporting here is from, from one of the institutes of the Federal Agency for Water Management, which is dealing with land and water management research. So we understand ourselves as, a, uh, as an institute which is supplying the ministry, the policy, with fact base, with facts, okay? We're trying to produce science to support minist the ministry. Uh, we are not able to influence policy, uh, and you will see later on that it's really this is uh, this is one of the big problems that 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 I'm having, and that's why I'm getting tired slowly with all the years fighting uh, fighting for soil uh, conservation. Uh, yeah, so we also so we also providing information on measures that could be uh, measures that could be used for implementation in soil policies and we're doing evaluation on the effects okay uh, let me see just to okay to give you a uh, to give you an idea of, of how the legal background in Austria is, is composed of. We have on the one side the Water Framework Directive, which has been implemented in 2002, so quite 20 years ago, uh, with, the, with the goal to achieve a good ecological and chemical status of the water bodies. There are several rules. Probably most of you may know there is a requirement for improvement of the water bodies and there is a prohibition of deterioration. Uh, however, unfortunately, we forgot to include any direct measures to soil erosion. If we had done this, we wouldn't probably we wouldn't be sitting here now because there would be the, a, a straight way forward. Uh, yeah, that's it. And then we have the, 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 the common agricultural policy with the first pillar and the second pillar, the, the direct measure, direct payments, uh, the greening stuff, uh, gross compliance, and the second pillar with the voluntary measures. And I'm mainly going to talk about, let me see, uh, well, let's continue first. 
We have the, uh, then we have the national implementation uh, of, these, of these two big uh, legal bodies, which is the so-called Wasserrechtsgesetz, water law of 1959, then we have the uh, CAP and the rural development, and then in the regional development, in the regional implementation, uh, we have the uh, soil protection laws of the federal provinces. So soil protection in Austria basically is provided by the regional governments. It's a regional thing, and the, and the state has not much to say. Yeah? Unfortunately, the regional governments, some of them not even have a, a soil protection law, although, although they always pretend we have a lot of laws. But in fact, not every uh, province has, a, has, a, has its own uh, law on soil protection. But worse, the content of the soil protection laws is basically saying, in terms of erosion, where I want to focus now, is basically saying you need to prevent erosion. Thank you very much. That's a law which is <laughs> not very useful for anybody. Also, yeah, so it's, it's very unfortunate. Okay, uh, what I want to do uh, today is to talk a little bit about some cross-compliance uh, measures. Basically, the GAIC number six, I think, it's about this uh, slope, uh, a, 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 a minimum slope of 18%, which has been implemented in Austria to, to, to apply soil erosion measures. And I want to talk mainly about this voluntary program which is in Austria called ÖPUL, which is the Austrian program for a sustainable uh, agriculture. So the Austrian agri-environmental program. If we look at the, at the last period of the ÖPUL program, which was from 15 to 20 now, and has been now prolongated until I think the implementation of the new one starts with 22, I think. Uh, we, have, uh, we have a number of measures which have been uh, part of the, of the program. I want to talk about this one, which is the greening of arable land. Basically, when we talk about greening, it is, it's, it's different from the greening of the first pillar. Uh, so with greening, we, we understand soil cover during the uh, period of no vegetation. So starts, yeah, there are different, different uh, detailed uh, uh, possibilities to implement this greening in, with different periods. But however, you have a greening. Uh, either with intermediate crops or, as we call it, the evergreen system, which is a different version, however. Uh, and then on top of that, you have the direct seeding or mulching. This is the uh, main measure of erosion protection in Austria, I would say. Then we have the uh, protection of erosion in fruits, vineyards, and hops which is an implementation of grassed interrows uh, until some period. I will talk later on that. Uh, then we have the organic farming, which we also consider as a, as a measure of uh, erosion prevention. And then we have something uh, preventive, uh, uh, preventive surface water protection on the arable land which is basically implementation of uh, buffer strips along the rivers. So this is the, uh, the idea. The buffer strips have, a, have a, a width of minimum 15 meters. I will talk later on this as well. OK. Now, if we look at the, uh, at the development of soil erosion during the last 60 years, we uh, we had, a, we had a, a model applying it over, over Austria. Uh, the good, good news, can you see? Can you see my, uh -huh, no. 
the good news is uh, if you look at this development, uh, if you look at the, at the, red, at the red columns, this, which is the soil loss over more than higher than 11 tons per hectare in a year, uh, you can see that the peak happened around the 1990s, and then uh, we had a decrease until 2008. Uh, if you look at if you look at particularly this uh, this part of the graph, you will see that we had a decrease due to due to the oil pool. There was a decrease, not very much, but there was a decrease. Uh, there was an increase in 2008. Why did this happen? Yeah, we have heard it several times today. Everything is about pricing. Uh, the costs, the price for maize increased in 2008, and immediately farmers uh, cropped more maize, which led to a higher risk of erosion. Yeah. Okay, so then we, uh, in the last, in the last several years, we, we developed a new approach to, uh, to be able to better identify uh, failures and, uh, and improvements in, in our soil erosion measures. So what we did was we, uh, we had this revised USLE stuff. Uh, you, you, may certainly know, know of it. Uh, the new, the, the innovative thing we did was that we really based all our calculations on parcels. So for every parcel in Austria, we calculated uh, a separate soil loss. Uh, you can see we have, a, we have quite detailed information. Uh, we used a, a 10 meter uh, spatial resolution uh, for the for the uh, topography. We used the Austrian soil mapping system. We had a, a particular study on the new evaluation of of rainfall erosivity in Austria, and we had all this information, which was uh, dealing with the, with parcel based land use. So what you can see here is the. Uh, then first of all, you get a, a you get a discrimination between grassland and you get a, and, and arable land. This is the first uh, thing when you have this parcel-based evaluation, and what you can see is that obviously soil erosion is distributed in particular regions of Austria. So if you go to the eastern parts of Austria, you beca you can see uh, there is a lot of uh, arable land, cropland. And if you go to the western parts of Austria, this is all alpine area, and obviously there is no arable there. There's only grassland. Uh, another example, if you go for the spatial distribution of the C factors, which is the management factors, factor, I'm sure you know about this, uh, then you can see uh, this is the southeastern part of Austria, quite heavily affected by soil erosion. And, and if you go for, um, into more detail of this area, you can see that you, know, you have get a quite good picture of the distribution of the different factors uh, uh, concerning uh, soil loss. I'm going a little bit more into detail with, uh, with respect to the management factor now, because uh, it's, it's more or less the only factor that you are able to influence. You cannot influence rainfall, you cannot influence soil. Well, you can influence soil to a, to a certain extent, but by far not as much as you may influence the management of, a, of land. That's why I want to l explain a little bit what we did to, you know, to model. We, we're always talking about model here. Uh, to model the management factor. What we got was regional management data combination. Well, probably let me explain uh, to go back like this. Uh, let me explain that uh, what you can see in the upper right corner is a distribution of the main agricultural production zones in Austria. Okay, And what we did was we calculated 
For each of these production zones, we did a separate study on the calculation of the, uh, no, of, of the, of the management factors. OK, so we had the regional management data for each agricultural main production zone, combination with the temporarily and specially distributed rainfall erosivity, as well based on these, uh, based on these agricultural production zones. And then we had an implementation of a basic crop rotation, a B annual crop rotation. We easily forget that the original uh, model application of Wishmeyer in the back in the last century was always dealing with rotations. We tend to forget this. So what we what we tried was to account for this and implement a, a, a biannual uh, rotation into our calculations. Okay, then we received agriculture uh, data from agricultural workshops. You know, in Austria, the, the agricultural communities are, are somehow organized in a way they meet in kind of workshops every year and discuss things, so we got information from that. We had several test areas from, from uh, federal offices, uh, from a federal agency for agriculture economics, chamber of agriculture. We, we, we collected all this, and that, then we obtained seeding and harvest dates. We had soil management dates on machinery and the date of implementation, the share of plow use, for instance, against the share of chiseling. So all this information was compiled on the basis of these agricult main agricultural production zones. And this led us to the specification uh, for the main uh, agricultural production zones to identify also the effect of biological versus conventional farming, uh, or to identify plow versus con conservation tillage. Conservation tillage means any other thing than plow. So chiseling, yeah, rotary hoe, whatever. This is, for instance, just to provide you with an example. Uh, this is the management practices in the different main agricultural production zones, as you can see on the very far left. Uh, probably I'm able to implement here a stick. Let me see. Ah, do you see it? Very good. Uh, so these are the different production zones, and these are the different management options that were recorded. So we think we got a very detailed picture of what happened in terms of practical agriculture. This is the management practices in the different main agricultural production zones, as you can see on the very far left. Uh, probably I'm able to implement here a stick. Let me see. Ah, do you see it? Very good. Uh, so these are the different production zones, and these are the different management options that were recorded. So we think we got a very detailed picture of what happened in terms of practical agriculture. Uh, so, uh, and then we calculated for each of the of the crops that were implement that, that were recorded in our in our automatic system. It's in Austria. It's called Invecos Integrated uh, Management system, something like that. Uh, we had the different crops of the first year and the, and the second year, which were then combined to a, uh, to a new C factor. And then this was then combined to, with a spatial extent of the crops in the first year. Uh, this is all the example for biological farming and grain maize. Okay? So we, of course, we also have conventional farming grain maize. We have all these combinations calculated. Uh, then we had some weighing because we just, from these main agricultural production zones, we knew that the percentage, uh, a particular percentage was using plow, another percentage was using chisel. We had a weighing and then we've, we ended up with a C factor for grain, biological farm, uh, grain maize, biological farming, 0.25. Okay. To give you an idea of to what led all these efforts, 
uh, you have here the different, the different crops, you have a C factor, and you have here, uh, just in this example, the change of, uh, of crops, of C factors, depending on the use of plow or chisel. Okay, so you can see there is but a certain in influence, but it is not very highly influenced. Now to the main results. Uh, what you can see here is the calculated soil loss for the year 2018. We're now doing this all two years. We're repeating our calculations. For 2018, what you can see is that you have a, uh, of course, you have a, a particular uh, particular regions in, in Austria where you have a very high soil loss, which is the Alpine forelands. Then here, this area, which is in Austria called uh, Weinviertel. Then you have uh, very high soil losses here in the southeastern parts of Austria. Uh, the extremely high soil loss, which is which we deem, and that's why I was asking for the for the uh, uh, for, the, for the limits of soil loss, we, we took it from the US, I have to say, because there is no limit available in Europe. Uh, the extremely high area accounts to around 2,200 uh, square kilometers. If you compare it to the figure which I have shown before, it's about 30% more than we calculated before. But this is, this is what happens when you use different modeling approaches. You know? uh, the mean soil loss in Austria, uh, all, all land use and all, all combinations included is, we calculated to about 3.9 tons per hectare. But this includes grassland, arable land, biological, conventional, all types of, of management. I don't know how high the uh, soil loss for Spain is, for instance, the mean soil loss for Spain. Has it been calculated? Do we have any? Yeah. Is it higher? <laughs> no mucho más. Yeah. The problem with means is you don't see the extremes and you don't see the regional, you know, the regional focus. We have that problem in Austria as well. Uh, okay, now if we come to the effectiveness of mulching, direct drill, and greening, I, it's a little bit too much. But the, the main, th so what you have on the x-axis is that you have these different uh, main agricultural production zones. You can see quite quite a heterogeneous picture because. In some agricultural production zones, you just don't have, uh, you don't have an erosion problem. But in others, you have. Uh, here you have the mean soil loss. But the main thing you can see is that the effect of mulching direct drill was not very spectacular. There was not much decrease in, in the reduction uh, of the calculated soil loss. And of course, even less was the reduction with greening, which is understandable because, you know, what, what does greening in that sense mean? You grow a cover crop, uh, but you don't apply over, over the winter, uh, but you don't do any mulching or direct drill then in the, in the springtime. You just, you just uh, remove the cover crop, you plow, basically, or you chisel, okay? In Austria, the main erosion period is from April to September, because there we have our uh, erosive events. So when you grow a cover crop from August to March or even February, you won't have you won't have a big reduction. That's obvious. So the mean reduction or the mean effect of reduction in cover crops only was about 10 to 12 percent reduction in soil erosion. Something at least. But, uh, but it's surprising that you have a, a very bad reduction with mulching and direct drill. Now, why is this? For, don't forget what we're talking here about is the 
total effect. Uh, the good news, the effect was highest in those areas where we had the highest risk of soil erosion. So that's the good news. Uh, the bad news is, why do we have such, such uh, well, in, I wouldn't say insignificant, but uh, uh, a small decrease in, in the effect was because the participation rate was so small. Why was the participation rate so small? Because it's a voluntary program. So if you're not able to convince the farmers that, they, that it would be a good thing to apply a, a particular measure, they're, not, they're just not doing it. Yeah? Uh, so only 10% of the whole area. If you, if you think, if you consider that about only 30% of the area has been, uh, in, has been grown uh, a, a crop which is particularly prone to erosion, like maize, sugar beet, uh, sunflower, potato, things like that, then the participation rate would increase to 30%, but still, this is not enough. And we have not been able to increase the participation rate since years. Uh, if you, if you, uh, if you look at the only at those at those fields where mulching and direct drill have been implemented, then you see that obviously, of course, there was a good effect. But of course, only in those on those fields where you had a practical implementation of the measure. Okay, so potentially the measure is very effective. We know this all since long time, of course. Uh, in our case, we calculated with an effectiveness, or the model, the model calculated an effectiveness of, I think, uh, 50. Um, I think it was like 50 percent for mulching and it was like 70% for, for direct drill, which also offers another problem. Also, uh, is, uh, the, problem the main problem also is that there is no difference between mulching and direct drill. So you only, you get the, it's all included in one measure. So whenever you want to uh, apply for, for direct drill or mulching, you only get a certain amount of money independent of the effect that mulching doesn't cost anything, basically. So once you know how to implement, it's a win situation for you. Direct drill is costly because you need particular machinery, which you don't need for mulching. You can do mulching with almost any machinery you have at hand. Uh, so why is that done? Why don't we separate? M I'm, I, don't, I, did, I don't see completely why this happens, but I'm supposing the reason behind is not to exclude mulching from the measurement scheme. Because if you put it separately, you can only get money for a voluntary measure if it costs you in addition to what you do. And for mulching, it would be quite difficult to explain why you would need more money, because in fact you need less money. So I think that it was the political decision to put these two measures together in order not to uh, eradicate the, the measure mulching from the voluntary Öpul scheme. That's what I'm supposing. But we, ne we never know exactly what happens inside the decision uh, rooms. Okay, now we go for wine production. It's always good to have projects on wine. We had a nice project together with Jose in a uh, European project, and, and there came some results out of that, and also Gemma Guzman, Guzman La Buena. I, <laughs> I learned 
<laughs> I learned from, I was visiting Donjana uh, yesterday, the day before, and there I learned there was a guy called Guzman El Bueno. And that's why I'm calling her Guzman La Buena. Uh, so what, what the system that you can have in Austria basically can be divided into four different or applications or, or management systems. You may have a complete uh, cover-free surface. You may have a, uh, a cover in interrows, but keeping the rows free, vegetation free. You may have uh, uh, a cover uh, in interrows in every second interrow, given the, the uh, and then you may have a cover everywhere. Okay. Now, if you calculate the the management factors for these uh, for these different management treatments, you may find out that you have a uh, you have you may be quite effective in reducing soil erosion when you apply uh, uh, the different options. What you can see here is. Uh, the result of an exercise where we, where we chose a particular location, area, a region in, in, in Austria, and we looked, that's why you have here the share of the total area, uh, which is not so important in our case, but what is important is that you, you, you tremendously decrease your erosion problem when you do, uh, when you do cover crops in, in vineyards. The good news is, well, it, it all started with bad news. The bad news arose in 1986. There, we found out that our wine growers were putting glycerin into our wine bottles uh, to improve the quality of wine. This was a big scandal in that time, and it, it resulted in a, in, a com in a very strict law on wine production. In Italy, for, uh, by the way, there was the same problem, as I remember. However, in Austria, they, they restructured the wine le uh, legislation completely and, and really had a very, uh, implemented a very strict law on wine. And this led to a complete, you know, a move of, of focus away from mass production into quality production. And this also led to the implementation of, of, uh, of, of management options that were not doable before, because there, there's always this battle between, between the water demands of the, of the wine and the water demands of the cover crop, which was not so important anymore because farmers reduced their yields voluntarily to improve the quality. Thus, they implemented, uh, they implemented cover crops in vineyards. I'm just moving back uh, to, the, to, the, to the share now. Uh, and this reflects more or less uh, what happens now, that we have a, quite a large share of our management options in vineyards are either complete cover where they have, whenever they have some kind of irrigation, they use complete cover, or they, they cover every second, every second interrow. And that's why the measurement, uh, the, 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 uh, the problem of, of erosion in vineyards has decreased tremendously. Uh, now, what you see here is the change of total soil loss due to greening in vineyards. Uh, what you sh well, again, these bars correspond to different regions, to different main agricultural zones. Uh, you have a reduction with greening, which is the green bar. Uh, and what you can see here is three different options. This one being soil erosion without any greening uh, with, uh, without any, any greening measure in, in, in vineyards. Then you have a second one, which deals with greening during winter time. Yeah? So in our present Öpul program, 
we have the uh, we have a certain period where greening needs to be implemented, which is from I think beginning of November to start of April, which doesn't make any sense because <laughs> this is <laughs> this is not the time when you have erosion in Austria, uh, and it took I the first time. I was, indic I was putting my finger on this fact was in 2010, just to, to tell you how long it lasts. Uh, and now, with the implementation of the new ÖPUL program, finally we have removed this option. There is no option anymore greening during winter. There's only the option uh, greening during uh, permanent greening the whole year. Okay? <clears throat> So, and this is the, the last one. Uh, why have we been so effective? Although the measure is not very useful, this one, because reality has overtaken legislation. The farmers just, they do not, they apply for the measure, but still they keep greening the, the farmland. And I think this was also the reason why they decided to remove the, uh, the measure. Okay, now we go for the question, who is the better farmer, the organic or the conventional one? This is a question which, which I don't want to answer. I just can tell you who, is, who, who, who produces less erosion. Uh, it's, the winner is the biological one. So if you calculate it over all Austria, Biological farming produced 3.7 tons hectare soil loss, uh, tons per hectare soil loss, and the con conventional produced 6.9. Okay, so <coughs> why is this? It's not because the, sing the single crops of the biological farms uh, have less erosion. So it's not the C factors of the single crops. On the contrary, if you, if you compare this, the management factors of, uh, for let's say maize or wheat of a conventional farm with a, with a management factor of a biological farm, the biological farm has an increased C management factor because you do all the management mechanic, mechanically. So you go through you go through the maze, I don't know, five, six times, and you hoe. You remove the weeds, uh, which increases soil erosion, of, obviously. But the positive effect is that biological farms have a completely different crop rotation. So they, have, they don't grow maize, 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 well, it's forbidden now, but they used to do it. In some parts of Austria, they used to have maize, maize, maize. And then corn. <laughs> that was the, the typical Austrian <laughs> crop rotation in the southeastern part of, of Austria was maize, maize, corn. <laughs> but, uh, but they have a, a different way of, 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 of management. They have, I don't know, maize, and then they have probably alfalfa or uh, something different. And that's what reduces erosion a lot, apparently. Or at least according to our calculations, I have to say. Okay, problems we have not solved yet. Probably you, you're surprised because you, you think, what, he hasn't solved anything yet <laughs> so far. <laughs> <laughs> However, <laughs> it, it gets worse, it gets worse. <laughs> uh, let's talk about the GAIC standard of 18% slope as an obligatory baseline for soil erosion measures. We calculated how much area, how much arable land would be affected of this measure in Austria. So what you can see here is the distribution, this is the uh, this is the integral from 18%, and this is the this is the interesting stuff. Uh, how much 
how big would be the percentage of, of slopes that would be affected? And you can see that we go from, well, we have one area which is really affected, but for all the rest, the effect is not visible, I would say. So the guide measure to, to have an, an implementation of 18% uh, as, a, as a baseline to implement uh, solar erosion measures is, is, is nice, but, no, but useless. Huh? Uh, there is some improvement, although, I have to say, because with a new implementation, they, well, we were proposing 10% then we would have had half of the area that would be that would be used as arable land would have to implement soil erosion measures it could have been that easy but <laughs> they just said no uh, yeah uh, so it seems that now we will have for the, for the new period we will have a baseline of 15% I'm not showing the effect of these 50. We have calculated as well, but I'm not showing it. It's too depressing. OK, then second problem. The soil cover after mulch seeding in practical agriculture. I'm talking about the particular measure of mulch seeding now. Direct drill, obvious, you have a very nice soil cover. That's why it's very much more effective uh, compared to mulch, mulching. What we did is just uh, we 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 had we have this uh, we have this we have developed this tool where we can measure uh, uh, the cover crop, dead material, uh, living material, uh, soil, uh, and what we then did is we went on fields in 2012, 2013, uh, a number of fields. What we uh, detected. We went on these fields after mulch seeding, so after the measure has been applied. So what you can see is we have received a mean value of 12% of soil cover. Okay? This means that you, if you go for, uh, if you go for these values, the minimum was 6%, the mean was, well, 14% in the other year. The maximum was 30 percent. Uh, then you can see that the effectiveness of, of the implementation is rather, even if you apply the measure and you don't apply it correctly, it's not very effective. So we were optimistic by using, you know, a, a, factor, a factor of like 50% reduction in our, in our assumptions. In reality, this doesn't happen. So we need to, to look for ways uh, to improve, you know, the factual soil cover after, and after the measure has been applied. So it's a question of potential effectiveness versus actual, actual effectiveness. Then, just to support our findings, uh, we did a, a rainfall simulation study where we had, it's a little bit complicated, what we did was we had, uh, we had different management options, mulching uh, with one-time rotary hoe, then we had mulching with uh, mulching one-time disc hoe, one-time rotary hoe, and then we had direct drill on fine seed bed or direct drill on rough seed bed. And on contrast to that, it was plowing and two times rotary hoe before seeding. Uh, what you can see is that the soil cover, which is the green line here, uh, the soil cover could only develop on the fields which have been applied with direct drill, obviously. For, this, for the fields with mulch seeding, we had a soil cover of, I think, 5%. So if you don't have a sufficient uh, soil cover, of course, you get a very high runoff and you get a very high soil loss. Yeah? 
Yeah? And in this case, the runoff in the soil loss of the mulch seed bed was even higher than compared to the conventional tillage. Why? Because with the conventional tillage, you go like 20 centimeters. You, uh, and if you have a soil which is stable enough, which we have usually in Austria, we have very few places where we have sandy soils. We have quite a lot of clay everywhere, more or less. If you have a stable soil, then these 20 centimeters of, of plow layer, they act as a storage, as a, as, a, as a pore system which can uptake water. Yeah. So, yeah, we need to improve our techniques to, to, to implement uh, mulching. Okay, we have new opportunities. The new Öpul program arrives. Uh, there will be, uh, again, they will keep arable. Uh, on arable land, they will keep the mulching and the direct drill still in combination because it seems there is no other way to support mulching. What is going to happen is we will have, most probably, we will have a measure which is called, which I call, mini dikes in potatoes. Potatoes have been in excluded from all consideration. Well, you can do mulching direct drilling with potatoes, but it's, uh, it's a little bit tricky with potatoes. Uh, but we, we don't talk very much about the enormous risk of erosion in potato fields. You know, you have this furrow dike system uh, where you create uh, large preferential flow lines. And it seems that we will have grass waterways, something which in the U.S. since long time is, is available, but now they want to, you know, they want to provide funding for it, which is a good thing. And as I already told you, in orchard wines there will be permanent greening, which is also a good thing. Now let's focus a little bit on the potatoes. This is the area where potatoes are cropped in Austria. Potatoes are very popular in Austria, uh, like in the rest of Europe, I would say. Uh, so we have particular regions where you have a lot of potatoes. If you remember, these are unfortunately identical to the region where you have high soil loss. So what you need is you need to have uh, effective measures. And we tested, and, and, and this story is a little bit, I'm a little bit proud of it, I have to say, because it follows what I, what I am thinking of how a measure should be developed. We had this idea to, to implement the mini dikes. We did experimental work. We had very good results, and the government said, yes, we do it. So that's, that's my idea of how things should go, you know, based on facts. So what, what, what do we consider mini dikes? You have on the left, left, left side, this is the ordinary way of, of uh, potato cropping in, in Austria elsewhere as well. So this is a, a, a symbol how this would look like. Then what we tried was these mini dikes. When you do the seeding, you have this chisel which all 70 centimeters makes a, a, a dike across the furrow. Uh, and you can, you know, you can also increase the, you can do uh, greening in furrows and you can do the best would be, you know, mini dikes plus the, the green vegetation. And now if you look to the, to the results of, of the experimental work that we have done during the last three years, uh, is that you have a tremendous decrease in soil loss. And on top of that, you have a decrease in runoff. So you keep the water on the field, which is what we really want to have. It's not only about soil erosion, we also want to have the water kept in the field. So what we create is some mini retention ponds. Yeah? So what, what you can see here, this, the, so the left one is the no measure thing, uh, and then it starts with the dikes, you get 80% reduction. Uh, with a, a 
with only the greening in the furrows, you get, again, you get some reduction, a good, good amount of reduction, like, let's say, 45%. And if you combine those, you get a really super result. Yeah? And the best is, it seems, legislation will overtake the measure, will offer it to the, to the farmers now. Okay, then the grass waterway thing. We know we have a problem. You know, until now, we have uh, we have had this buffer strip implementation, which is only uh, can only be implemented directly along a, a, a permanent stream. However, we have done studies where we see that in about 50% of the catchments the water never enters the buffer because it already is in a situation like this one. You can see here, you have some open ditch where the water immediately concentrates and then it will eventually end up in a closed ditch and it will enter, it will enter the, uh, the permanent stream without ever, ever having seen a buffer strip. Yeah. Uh, in addition, the effectiveness of buffer strips the, is, to me, is questionable in the uh, in this in the sense they they have it now applied in Austria. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. What you have, what you can see here, is the uh, a sediment delivery. Uh, depending on the length of a filter strip with different amounts of rainfall on two and two different types of soil. The graph itself is not so important. It's important to see that when you have uh, a, a proposed uh, width of a buffer strip of 15 meters, you will have almost no retention in many cases because the water will just flow through. So you need a very large buffer strip uh, to be effective. So what we're doing now at the moment is we're trying to uh, set up a, we call it a, a, region, uh, a, a, a regional scenario. So what, what they want from us is to have, to have proposed uh, all the fields which would be uh, which would be available for funding for the grass waterway thing. So what we're doing is this kind of study, you know, where we have, where you have the topography, then you develop your your flow paths, and you put your uh, fields uh, above it. And if you go to the if you go to this to this rectangle rectangle rectangle. Uh, to see, to have more details, then you can see that you would have to implement a buffer strip along this line. And that's what we're moment, in the moment, that was we're preparing for the government because in, I think in June or so, they need a plan to say, to be able to propose to the farmers, well, you will be able for funding or you will be not able for funding. So it's not a, a measure which will be uh, applied to everyone because they are they always, uh, they always have, have the fear that they will not have, have enough money. I remember well when we discussed this buffer strip thing 10 years ago. I was proposing, well, why do we need, an, why do we need, because we have the same, we, have, we did the same scenario thing for the buffer strips, and, they said, and I said, well, why don't we uh, offer it to all the farmers? And said, nah, we won't have enough money. The fact is, I think, that the implementation rate was 1 or 2 percent. So it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a fear which doesn't exist. And again, we do it the same way. We have to offer a, a kind of a regional scenario. And I'm sure that only a very, very small percentage of the farmers will do the measure. And there will be enough money. Yeah. But that's how it works. OK. Uh, it gets worse. Things we don't talk about, or we don't like to talk about, uh, because we don't have solutions. In fact, uh, compaction. 
I don't know. I don't know if in Spain there is a, a, a voluntary measure against compaction. In Austria, we don't have, because we don't know what we should offer. The fact is that we have an increase in in uh, in loads, which is tremendous. We 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 uh, we are doing a work with machinery which has 35 tons or more on an unpaved area in the field. This machinery, the same machinery, wouldn't have allowance to be transported on the, field, on, the, on the streets because it's too heavy. But on the arable land, we are able to do it. And there is a lot of other issues that we cannot, uh, that we cannot uh, control. We simply don't have a solution. I, I don't have a solution to the problem. Uh, this is the area. Uh, which, see, which is uh, the red one, it goes, it goes from low level to high level, danger. This is the area which is endangered for soil compaction or sensitive to soil compaction. And we did a study in the Alpine forelands of Austria. This is around the place where my institute is located, which means, and, and there it means that, uh, that about the, the, uh, the yellow green and the dark green are areas which are compacted. So about one third of the arable land that we were investigating was already compacted. Okay, the next problem that, well, I potentially would have a solution, but not in practice, is the change of land structure. Uh, this is uh, a figure of an area in the north of Vienna uh, where we studied the change of the number of fields during 200 years now. Uh, and what you can see is that you get a tremendous decrease in the number of fields, which obviously goes to the cost of the size of the fields. Yeah? So if you do the same thing in the in, in a, a hydrological open air lab that we are maintaining and managing, which is the uh, hydrological open air lab Betzenkirchen. Uh, if you compare the changes from 1946 to 2007, here you have 46 and you have 2007, you can see the same picture. You have a decrease, an enormous decrease in the number of fields, and obviously this goes at the cost of the size of the fields. Now, the change of this has nothing to do with the change in land use categories. The change in land, land use categories has not been very much. So still, you have 80% of cropland uh, if you compare uh, 48 with 2008. So there is not a big change in the, you know, in the, in the way we use our land. However, there is a big change in the crop statistics. So you can see that maize uh, has decreased to a large extent. However, we have to say that, for instance, potatoes are not existing anymore in that region. Yeah. Uh, so there is a uh, a, a shift of land uh, of, of crop statistics. And now what is the effect of these shifts of land structure and crop statistics? This is the effect. In 45, we had a mean sediment concentration of 30 grams, 30 milligrams per liter. Now we have a mean sediment concentration of 450 milligrams per liter. So a tremendous change in sediment load, which is partly due to the, we, we did a paper on that, it's just, it's, you, you, it's under review in, in hydrology, uh, hydrology Earth System Sciences in the moment, so you can put your comments there if you like. <coughs> so the change can be attributed partly to the change in crop statistics, but as well to the change in land structure changes. 
And I have no real clue how we can affect or change these land structure uh, things. Obviously, we can implement, just as in the Austrian program, uh, we can implement like uh, green belts and things like this, but this is not sufficient for sure. Huh? Okay, I come to my conclusions. The mean rate of calculated soil loss in Austria is around four tons. If you do that, like we did, we, we, did, we did it now in a row from, we did it in 2016, 2018, there is not much change. Uh, we will now, we're just now doing it for 2020 again. We will see if, if it changes, but yeah. However, if you look for the arable land, the mean soil loss is almost seven tons per hectare, the mean rate, which means you get soil loss rates which are really high as well. For the biologically uh, managed farms, you get a quite considerable decrease in the, in the calculated soil loss due to the fact that different crop rotations are used. We have a quite heterogeneous rate of soil loss in, in Austria, obviously. And we have more than 220,000 hectares of arable land at risk with a soil loss larger than 11 tons, which as a convention we used as a, as a, uh, as a border between what is still sustainable or not anymore. But I'm, I'm well aware that we can have long discussions on what is still sustainable and what anymore. Then we had, a, uh, we had for, the, for the measure mulching direct drill, we had different effect, effectiveness. We need to try to get to separate the measures, but this is still not possible uh, due to the fact that only additional, uh, additional costs are reimbursed with voluntary measures. This is a basic principle of the, of, of, of the scheme. Uh, we have a potential very good effectiveness, but the application rate is very low. So in total, there, there, is, a clear, uh, <coughs> there is a clear possibility for improvement. And we need a better definition of what a good application is. So I'm talking about this soil cover thing. We need to, get, we need to improve our, our definitions. The, the main problem arises because in the measure, in the Öpul program, the measure says you get money when you do non-inversive management. And that's all what you need to do. You keep your crop until, I don't know, I think end of March, you keep your cover crop and then you do non-inversive management. But when you use a rotary how, and you go over a field three times very fast, I guarantee there is no, not any stubble left, N nothing. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> the greening was only had small additional effects, although, I mean, a reduction of 10% is something as well. Biological farming was considered quite well as a measure, so we need to go more for biological farming. By the way, Austria is the country with the highest rate of uh, biological farms in Europe, I think 20 percent. Uh, the Geig, 18 percent, is useless. And for the sake of the wording, I used useful now. You can see, to, uh, in wine, I would say this is really a, a, a success story that, that we have. The new Öpul will bring new possibilities, the grassed waterways. I'm looking very much forward to this, <coughs> to this measure. We were, 
we were demanding this since quite a while, but it, it always takes, you see, it takes years and years until things change in, in policy. And the mini dikes in potatoes are an extremely, uh, extremely effective measure, which I'm uh, very optimistic for. I've been talked, talking about the challenges, the field sizes, the compaction. I don't have many solution. I don't have any solution for that. And now, I thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> if you're interested, there is some literature on that as well. Not really. Uh, you've talked about structure of fields, bigger fields. What is the land ownership structure? Do farmers rent land from land owners? Yes. Is that impacting structure, size of fields, and choices of management? The, the usual thing is that as a farmer, you, you have inherited a certain amount of land. Land is so expensive that you will not be able to buy additional land, but you will always rent it. Because, you know, you have a decrease in the number of farms everywhere. So in Austria as well, every year a certain amount of farmers, they stop and they rent their land. They don't sell it but they rent it to the other farmers which continue. And of course the new farmers, they will, you know, they will implement their farms or their fields into their old fields into the new fields so the fields become bigger. That's, that's the way it goes. Yeah. Okay, we, we observe that, that farmers that own their own land, that they're managing, use conservation practices as an investment in their future. In the rented land, uh, conservation is a cost. They tell us that. Mm -hmm. Is that similar here? Uh, to be honest, I don't know. We, we have been discussing this issue several times already. And farmers, when I, when I talk with farmers, some of them say, well, it's like that. But I don't have any, you know, hard facts on it. But it's, it may be, yeah, that it's that way. But however, usually renting is a very long lasting process. So the farmer rents his, rents uh, a land, a field like for 10 or 20 years. So it's not like annual, on an, on an annual basis. So, yeah, I'm not really sure about it. Okay. Um, for, for me, something uh, struck to me is when you show the figures about the surface at erosion risk, the main factor is the market price. Because when you, you, you explain the sudden rise from 204 to 208, and you told us, I understood that is because the, the price of, of mice. And exactly, yeah. So at the end of the day, <laughs> the main factor is, the pro is market price. Yeah. <laughs> so I think no matter what is the investment, <laughs> or how you well, know? even how well we, we implement the soil conservation measure, you see a sudden a sudden uh, rise in the uh, in the surf uh, at the surface on with uh, soil erosion risk because just a change of the market. Sometimes I think it, I, I think you know there was such a fast response. You know, in 2008 there was this there was a certain there was a certain trend towards um, biological gas producing. And that's why, no, that was the trend in 2006, and then they started, and then, of course, the price rose, <coughs> and then they had problems with their biological gas farming because it wasn't, it wasn't uh, 
uh, it wasn't good anymore. But it's so it's such a fast development, you know. One year the price in, is high, and then the next year the farmer says, "Well, I'm now moving to this." So he's very fast in his decisions. And I also think price is everything. I mean, if you talk to to other people, probably they are not uh, they don't have the same the same opinion. But I think you know, transport, for instance, our transport costs are by far too low. If you increase the cost of transport, as we do now with, with CO2 pricing, so I think we talk about, of course, we are in our, in our uh, burbuja, no say, our bubble. Uh, we are in our bubble of, of land management and soil protection, but probably uh, things are determined by other external factors much more. If we increase the price, probably uh, people will decide inside, the farmers will decide, well, it doesn't pay anymore to, uh, I don't know, to use heavy machinery. Or don't, I, yeah. Okay, I, I think that since this will be the last one, since we have limited time for lunch. So thanks again, Peter, for your open presentation and just a, just a reminder. The first one is that we should be back here at 1530 to catch up with the program. So that leaves us a little bit more than an hour and 15 minutes for having lunch. And the second one is that we, we couldn't organize lunch, so we should go to the closest places that they, we can ask now to the guys at the door to have some quick lunch in probably a small group because we cannot meet everyone. So we close the morning and we'll be back at 15 30. Okay? I don't know. Can we leave the stuff? I'm going to ask.